It is a simple story, really. A long story spanning thousands and thousands of years. But simple because it is a tale of life, of birth and death, of war and celebration, of hardship and plenty, of desperate struggles to survive, and of the rise and fall of ancient civilizations. It is a story of people, the ones who lived here before us. Today, we know this place as the Southeastern Woodlands, and we know these people as the Southeastern Indians. To get used to know to get it, right? You know, no stuck in our shower, get loose to get home. Eh, to you know to get it, right? There is a story the Cherokees tell, a story of the creation of the world. When a gigantic buzzard flew over the earth while it was new and soft, when he reached Cherokee country, he was tired and his wings flapped against the ground, pushing the earth down in some places and piling it up in others. This is how the mountains and the valleys were made. But the Cherokees, the Creeks, the Seminoles, the Chickasaws, and the Choctaws are relatively recent in this part of the world. As members of the five civilized tribes, they are perhaps the best known of the southeastern Indians. But they were not the first to walk these woods. No written records exist to tell us of their ancient forefathers. We have no legends handed down through hundreds of generations. No stories of the people who lived here and raised their families and died. But we know they were here by what they left behind. It may be no more than a shattered ceramic jar or a bit of bone or a rock carefully fashioned into a tool. But for the archeologists who dig history out of the dirt, these remains are enough to paint a picture of the earliest humans in North America. They came at least 12,000 years ago, and perhaps as long ago as 30,000 years. This was a time when the great glaciers of the Ice Age froze the oceans, locking up vast amounts of water and uncovering new lands. From Siberia, these early humans traveled to Alaska, crossing in a place that was then a wide land bridge and is now underwater. We call them Paleo-Indians, and we know them largely because of the stone tools they used for hunting and butchering large animals. At the end of the Ice Age, about 10,000 years ago, a new way of life began to emerge. This was the archaic culture. As the climate grew warmer, people adapted to changes in their environment and they developed tools to support their life in the southeastern forests. They made mortars and pestles for crushing the berries, seeds, and nuts that were an important part of their diet. They made axes and drills for working on wood. And they made hooks and nets for fishing. The archaic period lasted about 7,000 years, then around 1,000 BC, life changed again. This was the woodland era, a time of transition when people learned to cultivate some of the native plants they used for food. They also became skilled at making and decorating pottery vessels. Between 700 and 900 AD, a new culture arose, a civilization the likes of which had never been seen in North America. This was the Mississippian era, when the great temple mounds of the southeast were built. These massive earthworks, some of them measuring hundreds of feet around at the base, 
were built and rebuilt over a period of many years, gradually growing taller and taller. These distinctive flat-topped earthen mounds provided a foundation for temples, for chiefs' houses, and for other buildings important to the lives of the people of the Mississippian culture. The mounds faced a large open plaza, an area that was the center of communal life in Mississippian society. The plaza served as the village commons, as a playing field, and as a place for the rituals and ceremonies that were so important to these river people. During this period, agriculture began to play a larger role than ever before. The Mississippian people became increasingly dependent on cultivated crops like corn and beans, and their homes became more permanent as they stayed in one place to tend their crops. Along the Etowah River in North Georgia, archeologists have uncovered evidence of a flourishing Mississippian community. At one time, several thousand people may have lived here in a town that surrounded a number of large mounds. The largest was the Temple Mound, 63 feet high and covering three acres at its base. The Etowah Indians were skilled craftsmen and the artifacts they left behind give us a glimpse into the lives of the people who lived here. Along with other Mississippian communities, they developed an extensive trade network, and they exchanged many of the raw materials used in their art, art that celebrated the glory of their chiefs and warriors. But as rich and grand as the Mississippian culture was, it couldn't withstand the pressures that arrived from a distant land. When Hernando de Soto landed on the coast of Florida in 1539, he came with authority from the Spanish crown to conquer, pacify, and populate the land. The Indians, superior fighters that they were, were no match for the guns, armor, and horses that accompanied De Soto and his men. As they plundered their way through the southeast, they tortured and killed many of the Indians who resisted them. The Spanish were followed by the French and the British, who established missions and trading posts throughout the southeast. They forced the Indians not only to work for them, but to accept and adapt to European customs and beliefs. The old way of life, the Mississippian way, was destroyed. But even more devastating to the southeastern Indians were the diseases brought to the New World by the European invaders. Smallpox, measles, malaria, typhus, tuberculosis, chickenpox, influenza, cholera. The Indians had little immunity, little defense against these diseases that killed them by the thousands, wiping out entire societies. Within only a few generations, more than 80% of the population died. Four out of every five, young and old, the hope of the future and the wisdom of the past. No culture could survive a catastrophe of this magnitude. For the Southeastern Indians, it meant the end of life as they knew it. For the next three centuries, the tentacles of European colonization reached deeper and deeper into Indian territory. The Indians became increasingly dependent on manufactured items offered by British and French traders. Things like knives, axes, kettles, blankets, cloth, rum, and most especially, guns. 
No longer able to rely on the natural world to meet all their needs, the Indians traded their most valuable commodity, deerskins. But along with the hides, they gave away something else, a way of life that had sustained them for generations. It was around this time that the southeastern Indians reorganized themselves to form the Indian societies of the Old South, societies like the Cherokees, Creeks, Choctaws, Chickasaws, Catawbas, and Seminoles. One of the largest groups, the Cherokees, established the capital of their nation at New Echota in North Georgia. This was the seat of their centralized government, where they would gather to pass laws, hold court, and publish a Cherokee newspaper. But by the early 1800s, the Cherokees, along with the other Indian societies, found themselves squeezed into increasingly smaller territories. Feeding an insatiable appetite for land, white settlers pushed the Indians out of the places they had occupied for generations. In the early 1800s, federal agents drove thousands of Indians from their homes. And in 1838, the Cherokees were rounded up and herded west of the Mississippi River. By the time they reached the Oklahoma Territory, one third of them had died from cold and from starvation. For the survivors of this Trail of Tears, as for the survivors of all the other Indian removals to the West, life was changed forever. Yet in spite of it all, in spite of hardship and disease and death and relocation, the southeastern Indians didn't simply fade away. Some of their culture remains today, their influence reflected in a surprising variety of ways. Many towns and rivers take their names from Indian words. Chattahoochee and Ustanala and Ugeechee, Talapusa and Tallula and Conasaga. There are medicines first used by the Indians. Willow bark, for instance, from which our modern day aspirin is derived. And ginseng, a popular herbal remedy. There is tobacco, the first cash crop grown in the South. There are foods like corn and squash and beans, pumpkins and sunflower seeds. And there are thoroughfares. Our railroads and older highways are in large part located on the same game trails and trade routes used by the Indians. If we look back in time, we can learn about these people we call the Southeastern Indians. And we can learn about ourselves. Because who we are today, and who we will become tomorrow, depend in large part on our legacy from the past. For thousands and thousands of years, the story has been unfolding. A story rich in tradition, filled with puzzles and contradictions, built on the struggle and survival of generations. This is the story of the Southeastern Indians. Mm -hmm.